Not a day goes by in AI research in which we don't get a new image generation model these days. So take a look at the top row right here and listen to the prompt that generated them. Oil on canvas painting of a blue night sky with roiling energy, a fuzzy and bright yellow crescent moon shining at the top. Below the exploding yellow stars and radiating swirls of blue, a distant village sits quietly on the right. Connecting earth and sky is a flame-like cypress tree with curling and swaying, swaying branches on the left. A church spire rises as a beacon over rolling blue hills. That is a 67-word description of Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh. And it is also the prompt that generated the top row of images. And the paper does this to show that image generation models, specifically this one, they have become super duper capable of incorporating not only wild concepts, as you can see here, co-locating the Eiffel Tower with the Sydney skyline and fireworks and, and whatnot, but also you know, minute details about things in the image and where things are and how things look. So we've gone from essentially uh, conditional GANs where we could create one of 10 classes to something where we can input like a little essay about what we want to see and get it get it out. So this is by a group of researchers as of researchers out of Google research. And uh, they are a parallel work to the Imogen model that you might have seen. So this model or the paper is called scaling autoregressive models for content rich text to image generation. But the uh, the model is called Called, let me grab if I can. Let me grab pen. The model is called P A R T I. And I have no clue how to pronounce this. This could be party. Uh, maybe the, the pronunciation is on the art or on the part because it's pathways, like it's uh, or party or I have no idea. Let's call it party. And party is a model that generates images from text as we have so many models. However, it doesn't do this in the same style as like Imogen, which is a diffusion model. It is an autoregressive model. So here you can see a bunch of other outputs like this. This is insane. Look at the left side right here. A photo of a frog reading the newspaper named Toe Day. That the newspaper is named Toe Day. Like, how crazy is that? Um, that in itself is pretty funny. But we know that these image to, sorry, these text to image models are pretty bad at spelling stuff in images. Well, not this model, as you can see right here. It gets it completely right. It doesn't always get it right, but it gets it right often enough. Or this one. Portrait of a statue of the Egyptian god Anubis wearing aviator goggles, like uh, another connoisseur of uh, fine eyewear, I see. White t-shirt and a leather jacket. The city of Los Angeles is in the background. High res DSLR photograph. That's literally, that's the academic version of the Unreal Engine trick right here. And you can see the images spot on. So this requires a lot of knowledge, not only of, you know, you know, how what a DSLR photograph is, but also how the skyline of Los Angeles looks, how the Egyptian god Anubis looks, right, and the composition of things together, like these, this god was never in a leather jacket depicted, I guess, maybe on the on the internet, you'll find anything. Uh, but you can see a bunch of more examples right here. I specifically love the thing on the left side here. You can see that they generated images. So the prompt is um, three quarters front view of a XYZ coming around a curve in a mountain road looking over a green valley on a cloudy day. So X here is any of the colors blue, red and yellow. Y is any of the numbers. Uh, 1977, 1997, and 2017. And Z is any of these uh, car types. And now look that the model can essentially track the, uh, the, the historical evolution of these cars. So not, not only does it know what a Porsche is, 
It also knows how a Porsche in 77 looked like. Maybe it's not exactly the correct year, but this is pretty crazy. You can see a bunch more examples right here. They do a lot of examples with animals. I specifically like the raccoon here in uh, the style of cubism. Um, so this is going to be very, very powerful technology. We can immediately see that um, you know, the quality of these models gets fast, gets quickly, sorry, gets well, gets better so quickly that in the foreseeable future, we're going to have super powerful tools to just create and edit images from text. Look at the left side here, a giant cobra snake made from salad. I, you know, I'm sure like they, they even say these are cherry picked, but still this is insane. Now, I would love to tell you that behind all of this cool development is a really cool idea, like is a smart architecture and something like this, but I'm afraid it is not. It is simply scale and not simply scale. I mean, you have to have the sort of correct uh, base architecture. But there's nothing like particularly, there's no cool invention in architecture or a neat trick involved or anything like this. It's really just plug basic things together, make them really big, train them for long on a lot of data, and you'll get quality. So this is the model overview right here, the overview of this party or part-time model. Uh, this is, as I already said, in contrast to Imogen, it is an autoregressive model. So not a diffusion model. What happens is that on this side here, you have this VQGAN image encoder and decoder. Well, they call they don't call them encoder and decoder, they call them tokenizer and detokenizer. So if you are not aware, uh, autoregressive models, they work on tokens. Now tokens in usually in natural language processing are words or part of words. So these would be tokens, token one, token two, and so on until token n. And then you what you would try to do is you would try always to predict the next token. That's what makes it autoregressive. You feed in parts of a token sequence, like parts of a sentence, you try to predict the next one. That's exactly what you see right here in the architecture. So you pass in the start of sentence token, you try to predict the first token and you pass in the first token. And then from these two, you try to predict the second token. And then you put that here from these three, you try to predict the third token and so on. That's the autoregressivity. In text that works well. However, in images, uh, it's not quite obvious how to do that. That's why you first need to get from the image space to the token space. So we need a way uh, for any given image that we get out a sequence of tokens. And it can't be the pixels themselves. Like we, um, we would like to have tokens that are kind of latent and have sort of a bit of meaning, not just individual pixels, because that first of all, is too many pixels. And second of all, um, there's not too much, let's say, information in, in the single pixel. So what we do is we have these image tokenizer and detokenizer. This is a, a, a VQGAN that is powered by a vision transformer. So essentially this is a model that takes this image, it ships it through a bunch of layers and at the end, so let's say the image at the beginning has a bunch of rows, a bunch of columns with its pixels. This goes through a series of maybe downscalings and so on. Oh, no, actually it's because it's a vision transformer. It probably even tokenizes, like it um, patches the image at the very beginning. So these would be image patches, then these are transformed by a transformer to a latent space, maybe they are compressed. Um, and then you get tokens. So you at the end, you can take these, these uh, things right here, or the things that correspond to them in the latent representation, you can take those as image tokens and you can unroll essentially this image and then feed it into this model. Hey, just a short interjection here from Yannick from the future. The idea, I forgot, uh, the idea behind the whole setup here is behind the whole uh, VQGAN is obviously that these things here 
are tokens, which means that they come from a set vocabulary. So the way you train a VQGAN isn't just to give you this latent representation of like uh, token-like things, but then you also quantize them. So there is also a vocabulary somewhere where uh, you have a set defined set of tokens. I believe in their case, they have like eight 8,000 tokens or so. And your image the, your image tokens must be of these 8,000. So the image has a bunch of tokens, but they all must be one of the things in the vocabulary here. Now the vocabulary is also learned. Uh, there are some techniques by which to learn the vocabulary, but this quantization is actually what then enables you to treat, essentially to treat it as a sequence of language tokens, which also come from a vocabulary. All right, back to Yannick in the past. The image tokenizer is trained as an, as a, as it says here, as a VQGAN, which means that you encode and then you decode again, and you try to get out the same image. And at the end, this representation here in the middle is really valuable because it's a tokenized representation of an image. So you put that into the transformer um, right here. And this is, as we said, an autoregressive model. So it gets as an input, obviously, the sequence so far. It tries to predict the next image token, but also it gets as an input the text. So this is the prompt that the user uh, puts in. So the prompt is a is encoded in a transformer encoder and is then fed in as a side input as a target for attention. So whenever in the layer here you have queries, uh, keys and values, I'm going to guess the query can also look at the transformer encoder, the query can also look at the keys right here. So over here, you'd only have keys and values. If you don't know what the attend what this all of this means, um, I have a video on attention is all you need, where you can learn how attention mechanisms work. So essentially, the way this is trained is the following, you attach a sentence here or a description of an image, and you attach an image right here, the image is then patched, it is fed through the um, VQGAN encoder, its latent representation is obtained, that latent representation is put here. Uh, and then you essentially train a decoder language model that has cross attention into the text representation of, uh, of the prompt. So you simply train this thing right here, like you would train a GPT model, or any other model. And this thing right here is trained, as I said, as an image reconstruction model. And this thing right here is trained, I guess, jointly with this I actually don't know this could this could not be true, but I think it is true. I think it is trained jointly. So that's the model, as I said, is very basic. I wish I could tell you something more interesting right here, but I can't. Um, <laughs> it's a standard, you know, bunch of transformers in sequence, essentially, every single component right here is a transformer. And because every single thing is a transformer, you can scale this thing by a lot. By the way, um, here you can see a bunch of the I'm not going to go into the architectural details quite, uh, quite as much. But they do also train an up sampler. So they have images of resolution 256 by 256. Ultimately, uh, they do train an up sampler as well where, um, so here, this is the up sampler, super resolution up sampler, where they can go from their pipeline, which does 256 by 256 to a uh, one, uh, 1024 by 1024 picture, essentially, but this is just up sampling, right? So there is, I mean, technically, no extra information right here, this doesn't get to look at the prompt or anything like this, it simply gets to look at this image and then make a four times larger image out of that. So where did we leave, leave off? Oh, yeah, I also wanted to say if you now want to get an image out of this thing, so not training, but inference, what you do is you attach only the prompt right here, right? 
you uh, encode the prompt, you put the start of sen sentence token right here, you let the model generate one, then you put that here, two, then you put that here, three, and so on. You let the model generate the image tokens here. You take those image tokens, you feed, you arrange it into the latent representation of the v VQGAN, and you use the decoder right here in order to generate the final image. So that's the whole flow. And then you put it through the super resolution if you want that. Here you can see the basics, uh, the basic architectural layouts. So there is the smallest model has 350 million parameter. You can see it has 12 encoder and 12 decoder layer. It's pretty standard transformer uh, scaling laws right here. I mean scaling laws, pretty standard transformer architectural laws. Um, they go through a 750 million uh, parameter model, 3 billion. And the last one here has 20 uh, billion parameters. So that's a decently sized model. It's not as large as the large language models. Um, and they do use things like sparse conv attention and things like this. But it is, you know, it's, it's pretty large, I would say, you could not run that at home very easily. So where does that get us? They have a big description right here, how they solve this architecturally, how they sharp the model, how they use parallelism, which is very interesting. I'm just not a expert at it. So if you're interested, I'll leave you to read this part. I, I found the at least the drawings here pretty cool. So apparently, this the uh, signal is routed like, you know, like so, like so, and so, so like in like a snake type of arrangement, so that always you can pipeline so that always one thing is essentially busy, um, as you send data to the next thing and so on. But as I said, I'm not the expert in this. And I'd rather want to get to the other things which are the data sets that they use. So they have three data sets, three main data sets right here. One is MS Coco. Now MS Coco, uh, as they show right here for the image on the right hand side, uh, it simply says a bowl of broccoli and apples with a utensil. So it just kind of is a high level description of what's in the image, it's like an image, simple image caption, right for this image right here. Um, whereas the localized narratives uh, data set, you can see that its description is way longer. It's uh, more linguistically prosaic, uh, but it is also much more descriptive of the actual image like so the top is if you want to tell someone what's in an image. And the bottom is more like if you want to like really paint the picture like no pun intended, or if you want to describe the picture to someone so that they could maybe recreate it in some way. And it turns out that we are now at the point with these image generation models where they are so good that we need data sets like the bottom one to really push them to their limits. And not only that, but the authors here find that there are even problems with that because these image data sets, they're always created in a way that an image is given and then the humans are asked to write a description, which is really good because then you have image and description together, right? However, the authors here note that this prevents, for example, fantasy pictures, like uh, we saw before the the raccoon in cubism that it doesn't exist. So it can't be in any data set or Anubis in a leather jacket doesn't exist. So it can't be in any data set. Now, while we rely on generalization, uh, during training for the model to learn these things, we actually need data sets like that to to evaluate whether they can really do these things, right? Otherwise, we're left with sort of subjective evaluation. So they come up with an with their own data set, which is called party prompts. That's actually also the thing they release as far as I understand. And obviously, as uh, all of the recent works in big models, this thing isn't uh, released. The, the, there's no code, there's no I mean, the code would be trivial. Uh, there's no weights. Uh, there's no training recipe. There's no um, some of the data sets are proprietary, if I understand correctly. Uh, so 
The paper is more open about what they do, but still that there is no way of accessing this. So party prompts, this is a data set that essentially only consists of prompts. So there's no images in this data set. And I believe the only way you can really assess thing is you can let the model um, generate stuff and then you can let humans rate it. That's essentially it. Um, the party prompts, it is pretty interesting because they create these prompts by letting the prompt engineers sort of, they choose, for example, a challenge. So the challenge might be perspective, right? Uh, which could be, um, you know, I need a prompt that asks for some object in some, per in some specific perspective that is unusual. Or, uh, yeah, quantity, like I need a prompt that a that asks for a given number of things, because we know that these models, they're not super good at counting, right? I mean, we also thought the models aren't super good at spelling, and now it turns out, well, if we just make them bigger, they are. So, you know, I'm fairly confident they're gonna be good at counting in a short while. Uh, that's the challenge. There's also, if I recall correctly, ah, oh, this is this upper table right here, like categories. So there are categories, animals, there are categories, illustrations, and so on. So you can see this is a diverse set of category challenge combinations, and they make a bunch of prompts for each one. I think they have about 1600 prompts in total in this party prompt eval set, which is a pretty neat thing to have, even if it comes without images. So now they train the thing with their whole architectural shebangs with the parallelism and the pipelining and the yada, yada, yada on TPU V4, I think. Um, so this is a huge operation. So what does that give us? I want to just jump the evals here on the metrics because yes, 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 they're very good. Very good. Uh, they're also very good as rated by humans. Humans, very good, uh, which is... What's interesting is they have, for example, a retrieval baseline, which simply retrieves images from the training data set. And even if the, if the obviously image text match, the party model wins because you can actually create an image and not retrieve one. But even in image realism, you can see the retrieval is only slightly higher in realism, right? Every single image is real that the retrieval retrieves. And still the humans rate the realism of party almost the same, which is quite speaking for the model. The loss curves are also pretty interesting, especially interesting that the 20 billion model here, it takes quite a time to, to come down here, right? Uh, it kind of has to, it gets surpassed by the 3 billion model initially and then uh, overtakes it which maybe means that we haven't exactly found the right training recipes yet for these largest of models. So this now is the, the cool part where they put the model, uh, the models next to one another. So this is the same prompt with mm, all of these different models. And you can just see where scale gets you. This is a port rep photo of a kangaroo wearing an orange hoodie and blue sunglasses standing on the grass in front of the Sydney Opera House holding a sign on the chest that says, Welcome Friends. And you can see my, this, these, these things right here, this and this, there may be like Dolly Mini kind of style pictures and they're also that scale, right? And then we go to the, the 3B model. And this is something that would be familiar, maybe from something like uh, Dali or Dali, maybe between Dali and Dali 2, right? These things, you can see they're bad at spelling. But as soon as you go bigger, all of a sudden, welcome friends. Bada boom, there it is. Not bad at spelling anymore. All you need is scale. That's crazy. The sign, very deep learning. <laughs> Look, as the model learns to spell, um, initially it can only do Russian or whatever. And and just eventually, it, it would actually be funny if that was like actual Russian and it said very deep learning. Like, can you imagine how crazy that would be? Well, in any case, and also the, the Grand Canyon, right? 
so that there's kind of structure here and so on, but this very, the very deep learning, perfect. Uh, a blue Porsche part in front of a yellow brick wall. You can see it doesn't always work, um, but it works better and better and better with scale. Crazy. And here, <laughs> this is like, maybe like, is, is this the direct shot at Gary Marcus? Because the challenge is like an os an astronaut riding a horse. So astronaut riding a horse in the forest. Even the three billion model. Oh, oh no, it's going to be a horse riding an astronaut, which is going to come up later. And it, I promise it's going to be funny. Um, but yeah, an astronaut riding a horse in the water, in front of them, water lilies and so on. A map of the United States made out of sushi. So as you can see, these these results are fairly insane. Infinity, the back of a violin, four cats surrounding a dog. So now they're really testing these individual categories. Infinity is an abstract concept. Back of a violin is perspective. Four cats surrounding a dog is this quantity metric. You can you can see there are four cats, right? So yeah, I'm pretty confident that with with scale, these types of problems are going to be solved. Scroll gives an apple to a bird. Um, yeah, so what's interesting is they have this narrative of what they call growing a cherry tree. So obviously these samples here are cherry picked, which means that they take out whatever they think are good samples to present in the paper. However, they detail fairly extensively how they arrive at this thing. So what they do is they don't just come up with these long prompts by themselves. Well, these aren't long, okay. But, you know, the, these long prompts with Anubis in front in a leather jacket in front of Los Angeles skyline, they don't just come up with them on the spot. They have a process of coming up with them and the process is detailed here. So for example, they have this idea of combining like a sloth with a van, right? So they start by just exploring the model and entering things like a smiling sloth, like what, what comes out, right? And a van parked on grass. There are always good images and bad images that turn out and they sort of learn how to have, they have to tweak the prompt to get what they want. Once they're happy, they go on. So they modify the prompt a bit. So here is the smiling sloth wearing a leather jacket, a cowboy hat and a kilt, or wearing a bow tie and holding a quarter staff. So they kind of explore, they go more and more, as you can see, as you go down this um, tree, this cherry tree, as they call it, they go down and down, they detail well, sometimes there's problems. Uh, this one, I believe, has two two arms on this side and so on. So, but still they refine and refine and refine. They finally try to combine them, right? Um, yeah, here is here is a combination. They refine again. They try to combine the two prompts again. And at the end, they get to something that they might be happy with. For example, the thing here on the left, um, like this one right here. But I found this pretty interesting, like this process of arriving at these things. So you can't just enter any old long sentence and expect the model to do well, but what turns, what might, what will work often better, at least as they describe it, is to go through this process um, right here, which also means that full artistic freedom is a bit away. So it is almost like, Yes, you are guiding the model with your inputs, but also the model is kind of guiding you by what it does well and what it doesn't do well if you go via this process. And if you don't go via this process, then I guess you can expect that um, you you can expect that it might not work as well. So they also have some fa failure cases, which is pretty cool. For example, um, they failure cases like color bleeding, where you describe the color of one of the things in the image and, and sort of the other take on that, um, that color. Uh, there's also counting failures and so on, localization failures. 
for example, here the prompt is the prompt is um da, 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 da. oh yeah, the Great Pyramid of Giza situated in front of Mount Everest. That's the bottom two pictures should be that. You can see this okay, I mean this isn't this isn't too bad. Um, but this here is just like the pyramid with sort of a Mount Everest cover, right? You can see these models, they sometimes, if they can't fulfill the prompt directly, they'll kind of mix, they'll, they'll just try to get it done somehow and get it really close in text embedding space. That's exactly what you can see right here. Um, yeah, there's a bunch, a bunch of examples and this one, I told you, it's the horse riding on an astronaut. <laughs> so they have to actually specify the horse is sitting on an astronaut because the riding is just, is just riding indicates too much that the horse is on the bottom. <laughs> but I just found the horse riding on the astronaut to be absolutely hilarious. Uh, especially this one. <laughs> um, yeah, but... All in all, I guess what I wanted to say is that this is complaining on a on a very, very high level, right? The the paper itself is like moving the goal posts already <laughs> by sort of criticizing itself for oh well, I specified like nine apples in a perfect arrangement. I don't have or right I, 10 red apples and it's only eight red apples like what a what a loser model look at that i mean this is it is crazy good how these models are and the failure cases here are you know yes they're failure cases but i don't think that if you told me three four years ago that this is the type of error that we're at solving um, that I would have said, yeah, I, I believe that. I would have way guessed we're still at the point where, you know, we we have mode collapses, we can't create most of the text stuff, we have artifacts and all kinds of things. And I think this is, yeah, it's, it's kind of mind-blowing how fast the progress here is. Obviously, half a year ago or so, yeah, I, I would have expected something like this, but I, I believe... Yeah, a lot of people must be very surprised, and including me. Yeah, like spelling mistakes, like complaining that, you know, sometimes text is still not spelled right. Like, nah. Even though, right, Dali couldn't do it at all. And now this thing is doing it almost perfectly, as you can see right here. Combining abstract concepts, look at the thing on top, it's... It's insane. Or here, like, ooh, this leg is in a behind the race car. Like, come on. This is uh better than I guess anyone had expected. So um yeah, I don't wanna waste your time too much more. I just thought this was absolutely cool. And I'm very excited to see where this is going next. Uh of course, huge bummer that we don't get access to this. I hope this finds its way into some products that we can use. Uh, as you know, I'm all for these companies um, making making money with their inventions. I mean, I think it's cool that they are inventing and, you know, if they want to make some cash off of it, uh, you know, good for them. <laughs> but I do hope that we actually get to use it. And uh, I it's going to be a fun future where for every presentation or anything if you need like an illustration you just you just type it right you don't go to the internet to search an appropriate stock photo you just type it it's so cool or you want to change something in a picture you just erase it you just say whatever here duh, change that part to something else so cool no photoshop skills anymore no drawing skills anymore just you and your mind and your creativity all right that was it um, as I said, the paper presented in this new system is fairly simple. All it does is scale a bunch of transformers in sequence, essentially. Uh, I presented a evaluation benchmark, these party prompts, and it presented, yeah, their, their model, which is ridiculously insane. 
that was it for me. Uh, let me know what you think and I'll see you around. Bye-bye.